This episode of This Agile Life has been brought to you by BrilliantAgile.com, providing agile and scrum training, consultancy, and personnel. BrilliantAgile.com. Done right, it's brilliant. Recorded on Thursday, January 9th, 2014, in St. Louis, Missouri, This Agile Life, Episode 31, Physical versus Digital Workboards. Welcome to This Agile Life, a podcast about what it's like to be agile in the real world. Hello, everyone. I'm the host of This Agile Life, John Sextro. Joining me today is my one and only co-host, Dr. Lee McCauley. Hey guys, how's it going? You just got me, Lee. Oh, it's just oh, sorry, guys. Where where is everybody? They, Jason, Amos, are you guys out there? Oh, I'm I'm lonely. John, you got to help me here. I'm with you, Lee. Oh, okay. I, I feel safe now. I'm here to help you on your agile journey. Thank you, thank you. I need all the help I can get. Don't we all? <laughs> Well, it's going to be me and you tonight, and we've got a full docket of things to discuss, and we should jump right into it. Let's go for it. So tonight, Lee, we're going to talk about having a physical work board, a physical scrum board, a physical Kanban board, versus having a digital work board or a digital Kanban board, and all of the great things that go along with that, or maybe that don't go along with that, depending on your side of the fence on this discussion. Okay. So I have to tell you that we have just gone through this discussion with a brand new team that's getting, getting spun up. And uh, as always happens, you go through the same discussions over and over again, right? Well, uh, do we want to use a digital around where I work now? It's almost a foregone conclusion that you're going to use a digital Kanban board. And yet, some of the best teams that I have worked on and worked with have all used the physical Kanban boards and they loved it. Um, and, and trying to move them off of a physical to a, uh, to a digital for whatever reason, usually the excuse was the customer wants visibility, um, is that, uh, and they, they go kicking and screaming, no, we don't want to do it. Don't make us. And, and I can, I can kind of talk about some of the reasons why people don't want to go off the physical, but then there's also some good reasons to go to the, to the digital as well. So let's talk about what we're talking about a little bit in terms of physical versus digital. So physical, just to state the obvious, is an actual board somewhere in reality, in the, in the real world. It's tangible. It's touchable. You get to go up there, manipulate the cards, move them around. You've got it on maybe a whiteboard or a wall in your in your team room. And a digital board is something that is presented via a tool normally. It could be something as simple as a fancy Excel spreadsheet, or it could be something expensive as a full agile lifecycle management tool like Rally or version one. And there's all sort of stratifications in between there, right, Lee? Right. So um so one of the things that goes on during this discussion of uh, the tool to use, whether it be physical or not, is what uh, what can you do with it? And what does your team really get out of that Kanban board, which is a really good discussion, I think, um, especially in a team to remind them of what's important about the Kanban board. It's not. It's not just about um, something that uh, that management uses. And in some cases, the, one of the arguments for the digital is that management gets to see what you're doing and can keep track of you, which is not necessarily the the message you want to give to a to a team of developers necessarily. Um, but uh, but that's not a good reason to use a tool, uh, right. in my opinion. And. What do you find? Let me ask you a question about the difference between the digital and the physical a little bit. One of the things that I've noticed is that when you have a digital system, when you have an electronic system, when you have an electronic board, that you tend to have a proliferation of stories that get written that never get 
implement it and never nothing ever happens to them and maybe it's because it's just so easy to quickly punch punch one of these into the system do you see that have you seen that i have seen that um I'm not sure that that's uh, a huge difference between the two, to be honest. I mean, it, when I've used a physical Kanban board um, on a previous, uh, a very, fairly recent team, uh, we did even have the proliferation of cards or, uh, on the physical one as well, because, of course, anybody on the team can write a story. And so as things would happen where they, oh, you know what, I just noticed this issue. It doesn't really touch the story I'm on, and so I'm not going to deal with it but I don't want to lose it. So I'll write a card for it really quick. And in a lot of cases, those really quick cards be become what, what were we thinking when we wrote those? Uh, I don't uh, remember. <laughs> I, I've just found that it, it's actually, it's, it's less viscous to type one up in the system than it is to grab the card, grab the pen and write it. I don't know. Um, I think I think it's all about probabilities of what what's the likelihood that someone is actually going to do that. And I think you're right. I think the digital one, you have a much higher likelihood that someone is going to be willing. They don't even have to get up out of their chair. Right. So exactly. Good point. uh, All of us lazy developers. And let's be honest, we're if we're good, we're probably lazy. (laughs) That's that's always the best. If I don't have to get out of my chair. The digital boards, the electric bo- electronic boards, they certainly have a lot of pros to them, uh, and maybe we can go go over a few of them. So, one of the things you mentioned, Lee, was that there's an increased level of visibility for people that maybe aren't in the team area every day. It's it's easier for someone, not necessarily even management or leadership, to connect in and see. It could be your product owner, it could be other stakeholders, right? So there's a distributed. Yeah, in fact, um, you could even do uh, a distributed team that way um, a little easier because then everybody can still share the same Kanban board and people can still grab cards and move them over and people can be doing their work and they don't have to be co-located. Um, and, but that's a different issue, right? Yeah. Uh, um, I, I think that that's a, that's a big benefit. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if it's the biggest benefit to me, the biggest benefit of a digital Kanban board is automatic metrics. Ah, yes. Yeah. Um, and I am horrible about collecting metrics to me. If I can't do it as automated part of the process, then I'm probably not going to do them in a way that makes them useful. I may try. I believe in them. That doesn't mean that I'm good enough to, to do it unless I can automate it. Metrics is, is a good one. And what kind of metrics do you pay attention to? Or do you, I guess it's just nice that the board, the, the digital boards, like you said, they automatically collect those things. They collect just about as much information as they can. And then if you decide you want to ever look at those metrics or report against them or look for trends, you have that, right? Right. And for me, uh, the ones that I think are important for a team uh, is particularly cycle time and cumulative flow. So those are the two that that I look at on a regular basis. Cycle time really gets at are we consistent with our uh, our throughput and and how fast we can we can get a uh, a story through the board and as long as we're consistent then that actually reduces our likelihood that we need to do um detailed estimates uh we can start doing the probabilistic estimating and stuff like that um so i i like that that cycle time is invaluable for that um the cumulative flow is more of a double check on a weekly basis, perhaps that that uh, you know we're we're keeping a consistent work in progress amount, and we're not uh, we're not ballooning anywhere, or we're not um, staving off. You know, we're not pinching anywhere. Um, but beyond those, it's a occasionally we might want to look at some of the other metrics. Okay, and in addition to those, you spec- you you mentioned some Kanban metrics. Uh, cycle time and cumulative flow. You can also get some scrum metrics like velocity out of the uh, digital boards as well. So I just wanted to point out uh, the velocity one for all of our scrummers that are out there. And why don't you, so you just, you, you mentioned metrics, Lee, and, and I started out by saying you could view it remotely. 
Uh, one of the other benefits, I'll give another benefit, and you can tell me tell me what you think about about this one, Lee. Is that um, the board is uh, easily easily modified so that if you decide that the team is going to change their work process, it's very easy to go into that board and to to change the way the board flows, the way the board works, uh, to accommodate that. I would say I would agree with you um, you for the most part under digital, but I also think that that depends on the tool that you're using. Um, Some tools, for example, uh, Jira is a great example. If you're using Greenhopper with Jira, um, it is incredibly configurable. You can do anything you want, but uh, it isn't necessarily easy. but it's really powerful. Uh, but then there's stuff like um, if you use uh, uh, GitHub and you use uh, Hueboard, which is which is a thing that you can uh, add on to to GitHub that attaches to the GitHub issues. Um, that you get a lot less information, but you get really good integration with GitHub, of course. Um, so, so there's trade-offs. It's really configurable. If you look at Lean Kit, Lean Kit, you can you can modify that thing all day long and lickety split, and it works great. Um, so, I, to me, right now, Lean Kit is probably the the best one I've seen as far as being able to modify your process on, uh, in in flight. I agree with you on that. I've I've used n- nearly uh, all of those that you mentioned, with the exception of. <laughs> Board uh, from GitHub. I've also used Agile. Uh, I've also used version one. Sorry, I've also used Rally, um, and and they have their pros and cons in terms of their configurability. For the most part, I've seen that they all offer the automatic tracking of the metrics, and of course, they're easily viewable by distributed people across the globe. Lee, can you think of are there other pros to the electronic digital boards? That's a good question. I, I think that um, the uh, the ability to to force whip limits um, and easily see them, um, the ability to to integrate with uh, certain types of source control, like if you're using a Git repository or uh, or SVN, different tools will hook up to those so that as um, uh, Hueboard, for example. If if you uh, if you do a certain type of of branch or uh, or check in with with Git, then it can create an issue for you. Um, and so you can kind of you can kind of interplay those. So that's kind of nice. Um, you don't get you don't get that tracking all the way down back to the code that was involved in that story. So being able to pull up a card in a digital Kanban and say, not only what was this card like and what was it about, but here's the code changes that actually occurred that made, that made this card work. That's useful. Wow. I mean, you Lee, you've stated so many things that are positives for the digital boards. Now I'm starting to have a hard time thinking about how can I ever go back to <laughs> using, using a physical board again? Okay. What what are right. some what are some of like the cons to the digital boards, and then maybe we can also talk about at the same time some of the pros from using the physical board. Okay, so um, now I get to gripe a little bit. Oh, here it comes, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> okay, so um, with every tool, you are going to have various types of of issues that. Things that don't match your process. So if you look at Rally, for example, Rally is great if you follow the Rally methodology, the Rally Scrum uh, method, and um, and it matches perfectly. If you try to modify it while they say, oh, yeah, they'll handle it. And to some degree, they're, they're right. They're not lying to you, but it's not easy. You're going to they're going to make you jump through hoops to, to go outside of their process. Um, then again, you could do something like uh, like Jira and Greenhopper that um, are missing some really key elements. For example, at least the last time I used Greenhopper, which is about, I guess, eight months ago, um, 
you couldn't couldn't easily uh, assign more than one person to a to a story, and that's a that's a classic one. Um, the only one that I've seen that does that well is is Lean Kit, and then you can't do it with their free version. Their free version of Lean Kit um, only allows one person to be assigned to a task at a time or to a story at a time. And here's the one. Here's the kicker, John, um, with Lean Kit. Um, this was so clever on their part. They won't automatically generate a story number unless <laughs> unless you get the paid product. Beautiful, well done. <laughs> Holy crap! Um, How could I possibly tell my stories apart? Well, yeah, I mean, because so many people we we use the story numbers as the branching schemes, right? Yep. And so uh, and so suddenly they just rip that out from underneath you. Oh man. I've um, had a similar experience, Lee, with um, with the configurability of the digital boards and what they let you do and what they what they don't let you do. Uh, my most recent experience is with Jira and Greenhopper, and of course, it all depends on your installation and and what what you've got set up, how you've got it set up. In our particular case, we have a huge department that uses the same installation, same basic installation of of Greenhopper of Jira Agile. And therefore, because of the way they have it set up, we cannot modify our workflows individually. So everyone has the same workflow. Of course, uh, this is you know this is something specific to the way we do things. Uh, but as you can imagine, and as Lee was saying, with these digital boards come certain constraints in terms of the process and how that process is going to work. Right, and that's that's just quintessentially against agile in general, which says you should be constantly improving and you should be adjusting your process as you feel pain uh, to try to fix those. And so, if the tool doesn't allow you to do that or or makes it difficult to it, whether even even in, uh, allows you to or not, um, that's that's an impediment to your process. So, if you're using a physical board and you want to change the process, it may be as easy as tearing off some painters tape and and reapplying the tape in the way you want the uh, the process flow to work, or if you're using a whiteboard, erasing some whiteboard lines and redrawing those lines, et cetera, right? And that's much easier than trying to go into a tool and do a migration from one process to another process. And what do you do with stories that are in flight? And what does that do to your metrics? So <laughs> right. from that perspective, a physical board is a lot easier to manipulate and change. <laughs> Right. And in some cases, there are some some interesting things that some interesting solutions that teams will come up with for various pain points that are really easy to do in a physical Kanban board that become really tough uh, otherwise. So, for example, uh, we had a team that um, they would occasionally stack cards together because they found out that they were going to end up uh, doing part of uh, one story um, in in the process of doing another one. Uh, they weren't going to complete the other story, but they suddenly were linked. And so they were able to, to uh, stack those cards together and then treat them as one um, when going through certain parts of the process. So they were able to implement an exception to the process when they had to. Now, that was really, really rare, but it just goes to show the, the flexibility of a physical one that to just do that on the fly uh, with, a, with a digital, it's just not going to happen. You're going to have to, I don't know what you would do in that case. I mean, it would, again, it would depend on your situation. With a physical board, like you said, the sky is the limit. If you can dream it, you can build it with the physical board. With tools, there's always going to be some amount of of uh, of lock in that occurs. There's going to be some amount of con- some some number of constraints that you have, like not being able to assign a pair two people to the same story, etc. I do or, or more. I mean, there are occasions when, I mean, we've had this discussion on the, on the podcast before about swarming, right? Right. Um, and, uh, and so being able to, to just, for us, just hang another person's picture next to a, a card. Now we've got three people next to a card rather than, rather than two, you know, okay, show me that one on a, on a digital board. No, nope, can't do it. At least not on any of the ones that I've seen. Something, right. something else that I find very rewarding about the use of a physical board. There's something about standing up, taking 30 seconds, walking over, touching the card, 
moving it from one column to the other. It just feels good. Uh, when I do that today on, on digital boards, it's like, eh, slide it across. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it doesn't seem right. as rewarding to me. Yeah, I mean, I've actually had uh, one of my teammates say, oh, you know, I really liked being able to move that card over into the done column. You know, that's that felt so good to be able to do that. And it was kind of like it was kind of like when you go out of a Long John Silver's and you and you ring the bell. Right. You know, um, I was I was felt like I was able to ring the bell with a physical one. And I don't get that feeling with the digital. You know, I wasn't going to tell this story, but now that you said ring the bell, I, I'll go ahead and tell it. Back in 2000, when I did my very first Agile project, and I was running it from the XP, XP Explained series of books. This was, we had no board, but we did have 3x5 index cards. And we had a box where we put the ones that were done. And right next to the box, we had a little office you know, bellhop bell. So every time we would take our card and we would put it in that box, we would ding the bell. And that was just fun, and it was, again, rewarding. Everybody would turn around and look. Hey, Katie put a card in the box, or John put a <laughs> card in the box. You know, and it was, there was something kind of exciting about that. It's a small little celebration. Absolutely. For, for, and for the whole team, you know. It's not just whoever happened to pull the card across. And it, um, is, it is something that should be celebrated. And when, maybe, maybe we should program the digital boards so that they do like a Fred Flintstone yabba-dabba-doo <laughs> or, or something at the end. Or when you yeah. move it to the done column, so you get a little more feedback. Yeah, that's that's a good idea. What else do you like about physical boards, Lee? Well, um, we kind of mentioned the uh, the pictures. We, we would use pictures of people that would we would hang next to the cards, and it was funny. I, that was the biggest complaint when we uh, were taking a team and forcing them to go into a digital Kanban board. What? Where are our pictures? We want the pictures next to the cards. <laughs> And uh, and so that seems to be a big issue. They want to be able to look over and see exactly who worked on a on a uh, on a story. And it's not just who is currently working on a story. It's like you come in in the morning. There's two people there. Um, well, did that story that that person is working on? Did they already have a pair that was helping them with that? And so I shouldn't bump that pair off. Um, okay, that sounded really bad. Um, <laughs> Let me rephrase that. I shouldn't kick that person off of that uh, out of that pair because they might really want to see that story through. Although personally, I would say kick them off because they've already, they were already on that story the previous evening. But anyway, that's a different different conversation. Um, and that that was something that they the team really liked was those little pictures by them. And again, I I think uh, Linkit does that pretty well now. But uh, <laughs> your agile greenhopper has has the ability to have avatars and to put your own picture in them as well. Yeah. Um, but but it is there's it's a little more flexible when you're again flexibility when you're doing it with a physical board. Let's talk about a con of using a physical board for a second and metrics. <laughs> so you already mentioned how yeah. difficult, how much more difficult it is when you're using a physical board, right? Right. Um, and this is something I struggle with a long time. And I have to say, this is one of my two biggest reasons for using a digital board is because of the metrics. The physical boards, there are lots of things that you have to add additional process to the team in order to say, OK, well, when you when you move a card into this column, put a little check mark on it or something like that. And it could be and you try to make it as, as streamlined and 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 easy as possible, but that doesn't mean that people are going to remember to do it. Every little thing that you add is something else that could go wrong. Absolutely, and and I've always felt that as well. And it as the as the coach or the the scrum master on teams, it seemed to always fall to my shoulders to be the one, not necessarily to to put the tally marks or to mark when things transitioned. But to take those at the end of uh, a day or the end of a week or whatever the period of time was and compile that into here's our velocity or here's our cycle time, uh, et cetera. And I always hated that, but I really wanted the metric. So I did it, you know, with the digital tools, it's just automatic and it's great to have. Um, if you can spread the pain equally across the team so that everyone participates 
Uh, it's I think that makes it easier. No one person is responsible for doing the collection or the analysis or the summarizing of the metrics at the end of the time, but it's just never going to be as simple as it is with a digital system. Right. I don't know. I don't know any way to uh, to make it any easier on a physical. Somebody's still going to have to put that into an Excel spreadsheet or something. So in addition, uh, s- metrics are harder. We we've said that, but it's also more difficult to uh, report out or to share the board remotely. Right? Have you had problems with that? <laughs> well, um, the biggest problem that I've had, we we actually at on a previous project that was using a physical board, we almost got to a point where we were going to put a webcam pointed at the, uh, <laughs> at the physical board. Yeah. And, yeah. And let people see it. Um, we did have a customer ask us to take pictures of the board every morning so they could see it. Not that they could actually read anything off of it from a picture, but <laughs> <laughs> that's a little tougher. You got to get a really high, I res a uh, <laughs> camera or video camera to, if you want to do that. But you literally can provide uh, people to have access to the board via a webcam. If you set that up, it's not unheard of. I've tried to do that uh, from time to time. It is a little more difficult to read and to see. Uh, but if, if you have a client that is really really hell bent on wanting to see that board whenever they want to see it. That's a, that's a real option. Right. Um, that my other thing, I mentioned that, that the metrics was one of my two biggest reasons for typically going with a digital. My other one is one we haven't actually mentioned yet, which is communication. Okay. With a digital board, you get a lot of, um, collaboration capabilities. So, as you have a turnaround about a story or uh, some some specific thing came up during the course of a, a pairing session that the next pair needs to be aware of, then you just add that to the card as a comment or as notes or something like that. You can even attach files to it. Um, so from a design perspective, the digital was always really nice because the designers could just add the assets uh, directly to the story card that the that the developers could then use and and you have those forever um, that's a huge huge benefit and it it becomes a lot harder to to manage that kind of stuff and to keep up that really good communication um, with a physical board okay i'll give you i'll give you uh the benefit of the doubt here that that's the case uh, if I was Amos or if Amos was here, I think he would <laughs> He would want to disagree a little bit, right? Typically, okay. Get, give me the Amos argument. I'll, I'll John. channel channel Amos a little bit and give you his argument. And to some extent, it's mine as well. But you make you make excellent points regarding uh, attaching information, attaching design files, screenshots. When you, when it comes to making notes or when it comes to just general communication about a story, I think a team would be better off to not use the digital uh, aspects of the tool to track notes or to try to communicate things. I think you'd be better off having that in-person, live, person-to-person, rich conversation about what's going on rather than, than just plugging it into the tool and counting on someone to come along after you and read those notes. So, so that's, I- the one, that's the one area where I'll... I'll kind of take the Amos stance and disagree a little bit. Well, I don't think that we're actually disagreeing. So let me clarify the way I was, I was uh, okay. saying this. Okay. Um, the, uh, you would still have all of those personal communications. If you're going to have a turnaround and you have a turnaround and you make a decision, the, the uh, putting information onto the story about what the decision was from that, from that turnaround stores it for the guy that wasn't here today and ends up on that story tomorrow. Um, so that, so that they can go back or maybe even the people that were in there, what did we decide on that? You know, we had a, suddenly we have a a month from now, we have this, this story that comes up that didn't we do a story like that? And didn't we already have this discussion? What did we talk about last time? Um, and that's, that's a good place to put it. It's a little funny because, um, I, 
I don't generally go for lots of documentation for um, unless I think it's is for good use. I think this is good use documentation, something that's that that goes along with the story. Um, everybody knows exactly where it is. I don't have to hunt for it, um, and uh, and it's it's useful. People will actually go back and and look at it as opposed to some other types of documentation. And even if you do have to hunt for it on the digital version, it's as simple as doing a search typically in the tool, right? You want to search for, right. we made a decision about using HTTPS versus HTTP or something. And you can search for, search for one of those keywords and, and maybe come across uh, where that decision was made and more of the background about why it was made. So that's a right. good point. It's, it becomes... Uh, it becomes a sort of knowledge base of decisions of uh, maybe architecture decisions that were made or business decisions, product owner decisions that were made. So that's valid. And that's a, that's a great point and a, another positive for another pro for the digital board. You could try to do some of this uh, with your physical board. And if you wanted to, you can almost physically attach like design information by stapling it to a card or, or that sort of thing. Um, I've tried to do, I've tried in the past to do kind of uh, blended solutions where we have, yes, a physical board, but then when we use something like a confluence page or some other sort of uh, easily modifiable digital resource to track information like decisions to put, things like design files that the designers might have made electronically and sent to us. But then you've kind of got this swivel chair thing of, okay, I've got a, what, what story was that again? Let me find that story and let me look it up on the confluence. Okay. It's story 397. Ah, there's my information. With the- there, there's still an air gap there that while, while it's as easy as possible and it's, it's not hard, there's still that possibility of losing that, that connection. Um, I've seen I've seen teams that successfully did things like putting uh, uh, putting design documents, not necessarily stapling, but you know, clipping them to the to the cards. Um, I've also seen teams that used um, or like stamps to say, okay, this went through the review process, or this this got the the design okay after after the de- after the development has been done. The designers have to look back on it and say, yeah, did they actually do it the way I expected it to be done? Is everything you know look right? And you put a little stamp right on the physical card. That's that's a little tougher to do. It's a little more heavy a process if you try to do it in a digital. You have to have their own column and stuff like that. What what would be some other pros for a physical board then, Lee, from your perspective or from your your team that you've been working with recently who wanted to go with a physical board? Well, one of the things that we had on that physical board that not all of the digital boards, some of them will, but not all of them will handle is an expedite column. So, uh, or an expedite, expedite row, I guess is the right way to say it, where we, we suddenly have this story that has to go through quickly. It takes precedent over everything else. And we want that to show up. It, it should be big, bright to everybody. And on a physical board, it's easy. We just have this extra little, uh, little row, um, where anything that's in that row, that gets first priority, period, end of story. Um, and, some uh, some con- digital combines will do this. Some won't. Some you only get your columns. Um, you can't do you can't do a horizontal and a vertical. Uh, you only get the horizontal. Um, or sorry, you only get the vertical. Yeah. So it's once again more flexibility for the team to do do the things that they feel like they're going to need to do. You you may be able to get that sort of service lane or expedite lane out of a tool, but it may be not, and it might be more difficult than it's worth doing, right? Right. And again, it depends on the tool. So some tools can do it. Um, I've seen, um, I think Jira can do it with a tremendous amount of, of modification. Um, and then keeping the status correct on those gets to be a real trouble and the metrics get screwed up. Um, Lean kit will do it without 
without hiccuping. Um, in fact, lean kit will actually do, um, you can actually have different columns for the different rows. And so that's kind of nice. You could actually have two different processes show up on the same board. Um, uh, the physical one, um, of course, you can do anything you want from that respect. You you can have um, our rows, for example, on one of our uh, one of our teams. Uh, each row was a feature, and so um, as a feature gets done, the label for that row needs to change, and the metrics for that row need to change to match to ma- to handle that particular feature. For the physical one, this was no big deal. This was changing out a, a card on a, you know, a label card on the row. Right. And for the digitals, a little more difficult. Once again, infinitely flexible to whatever the changing needs are for the team. And, and that probably go, goes right to the top of the list of the pros for the physical board. You just can't beat that with any sort of digital electronic tool because there's, they, you know, you're never going to get that, that un- Un, un, unconstrained set of options to change things like you would when you're in, just have a physical board on the wall. Yep. What about, and you may not have to deal with this too much, Lee, but what about, um, I want to say accounting, but that's not, not the right term here, but the accountability for um, stories working through the board or uh, the tracking of stories again, kind of back to to the reporting and the metric stuff, but providing some sort of of uh, ability for the for people to understand where has the work gone, um, where have we, how have we spent our money? That's where I was kind of going with the accounting side of thing. Is how have we spent our money based on the sort of work that we've done? Have you had to deal with that when you've been doing? client work it might be a, a very specific niche sort of thing I, I have to admit john that i i try to stay out of the uh, uh of the accounting part as much as possible because it'll just depress me <laughs> um, so uh uh so yeah the the customer generally wants some some notion that uh, they got something good for their dollar but for the most part that has to do with the working software not necessarily with what stories get done if they're worrying too much about those stories beyond uh beyond which features are prioritized and which ones we got done and that sort of thing um then they might be micromanaging a little much what about here's another situation to consider transitioning (laughs) items from the done status from the team's perspective over to um a team for beta testing, user acceptance testing, and this is kind of more into the into the realm of sending it to the client and or sending it to the business where people are going to do some sort of validation, some sort of of testing with the system. How have you handled that? That's an excellent question. So um, again, we're we're just kind of starting a, a new project where I'm at, and we're going through some of these discussions. You always have these little discussions. Um, about what your process is going to look like, at least initially, for a, for a brand new project, and the discussion came up of how do we do QA in this project? We are going to have a dedicated QA, and that's always the way we want it to be. But you don't always get that luxury. Um, so we are going to have a dedicated QA, and we want that QA to be engaged and um, and not feel like they're either being a bottleneck or um, not feel like they're being wasted. Um, So a lot of teams will, the development team will finish with a story, usually maybe even a a set of stories that make up a feature before the QA ever gets to it. And as far as the development team feels, they feel like they're done with it, right? They've gone on a different story. Right. Um, maybe even a different feature. And then QA comes back in a couple of days and says, hey, you've got, a, you've got an issue, um, which to me means it, it's, it causes a little bit of churn there. So now we've got a bug. And if we're dealing with bugs the way we should, then they go on the expedite call or the expedite row, right? And suddenly we have to drop everything and do those. Or at the very least, we should, they should be the next 
highest priority thing, right? Absolutely. <laughs> when, when, a, when a pair gets available. Right. I guess what I found difficult with, with this transition point is typically you want to send, um, best case scenario, your users and your beta users would be very closely located to you. So they could just come over and you could talk to them about what you were, what you had done that iteration, what you have just continuously delivered to their beta testing environment. And you can talk through some of that stuff, maybe as part of a demo. Uh, but oftentimes what happens is you have to kind of hand something over to them, maybe a little more formalized, maybe a list of the features or uh, a set of the stories. And it's just easier if you have something digital, you can copy and paste, export to Excel, yada, yada, yada. If you're doing a, a physical board, you've somebody's maybe got to do a little data entry to type up what the release notes are, et cetera, and, and shoot that over to them, right? Right. I and mean, it depends on, on how formal your process is. Um, but in general, you're right. I mean, the, uh, you generally want a, a beta testing uh, stage for any new releases, um, any new features that are going out, even if you're doing a continuous flow. Um, as far as your development team is concerned, that doesn't mean that your QA is going to be able to, to take each story as it comes. However, there is a way to do that. There is a way to get this, um, to get your QA involved and not allow anything to go out um, until QA is, has, uh, has okayed it. So personally, I like having a stable master branch, right? That is, that is my release. Uh, I can, that is every time a new story comes through, I can guarantee it works. Everything is good. Put it to production now, right? Or at least you could most of the time, uh, companies aren't comfortable enough yet to, to be able to do that. But personally, as a developer, I, I want to be comfortable enough to say when it hits master, it is done. Darn it. Um, and, and so we actually had a long discussion about how do we keep the QA within the process before something ever hits master. And, uh, and we did come up with a way of doing that. If you're interested, it's kind of off topic though. Uh, I think that's, uh, that might be a topic for another time. I'll, we'll, we'll deep tease that to our listeners so that they, <laughs> they keep checking the, the podcast stream to see when we, when we talk about how to incorporate QA into, into your development process to reduce defects leaking into the wild. Perfect. So any parting words leave from you on uh, the pros and cons of physical boards versus digital boards in our world today? Um, I think that there's one other benefit to a physical board that they don't, that we haven't mentioned yet that I, I want to get out there. Okay. The other benefit is you're not limited on the size of your board. Um, the digital boards, even if you're lucky enough to have a huge, uh, monitor that you can, you can use, you know, a 40 inch or something, um, it's still not going to be as visible. You could, you won't be able to put as much on it and people be able to see it as you can a huge 70 inch uh, whiteboard or cork board. I guess you're only limited by the size of the walls available to you, huh? Exactly. And in some case you can expand those walls with those rolling boards, buddy. Yeah. And typically walls are much, much larger than, than our roll around televisions that we have uh, in, in the, in our places of work. Right. I, I'm, I'm waiting for my IMAX Kanban. Wow. <laughs> you've got to get like i bet you could wire up like 15 projectors lee and kind of project this <laughs> enormous uh e enormous work board onto the, under the wall at work that's a darn good idea we got to try that we'll work on that we'll sell it <laughs> very good point um and my final words on, on this topic are that in essence i think the the statement always holds that it just depends for people what's right for them and what works for them. My advice would be, and I think Lee, you started to talk a little bit about this in the pre-show is to start simple. If you're a new team and you're just getting started, start with a physical board. That's probably the simplest thing that can work back to one of our agile sort of 
principles, right? Do the simplest thing that can work. And starting with a physical board is that simplest thing that can work. If you find that you want to track more metrics, that you have the need to report out in some special way, share information with a distributed team, you can always migrate to a digital electronic board at some later time. But just to get started, go ahead and get started with the physical board. And I'll tell you a couple of reasons why, Lee. One is the flexibility just can't be beaten. I think we've established that today. The other is that I think that there's a great deal of opportunity for learning on the team by having a physical board rather than just immediately handing everything over to a tool and saying, tool, just do this all for me. There's things to be learned about the metrics and why we track the metrics and how the metrics are tracked. Um, there's also that tactile feel and sensation of moving the things across the board and having that sense of accomplishment. And there's also the, the there's also the axis of the fact that this board is we can tear it down at any time and we can change it. So you know how it is with users when they see a a finished product like something electronic, like something digital on the screen, they feel like, "Ooh, that thing is set in stone." As opposed to knowing that that physical board, we create it with some painters tape, some markers, and some three by five cards, and we can change it at any time. So that's my advice to you. Start with a physical board, migrate to a digital board as, as your process necessitates. What is the old, old quote from Bill Cosby? I brought you in this world. I can take you out. And don't matter to me. I'll make another one look just like you. Now, that wasn't the joke, Lee, right? That wasn't the joke, no. We have a lot of people on our, on our Twitter, <laughs> at least one by a lot. I will say at least one that is, that is uh, crying out for the joke to be told. Oh, gonna, my gosh. I'm not going to put you on the spot and ask you to tell the joke tonight, but at some point, we, we've got to let the joke out. If I could ever find the joke, then I, I will be glad to let it out. That's got to be your mission. Before we go on to the, the Pixley, I want to invite all of our listeners to join us to continue this conversation on our Google Plus community. You'll be able to interact with the hosts like Lee and myself. You can help us decide on future topics for the show. and you get to engage in all of our lighthearted tomfoolery. You can join the community from our website by clicking the Join the Community button that's out there. It's a big, huge orange button. Click that. Join our community. We look forward to continuing this discussion with you out at thisagilelife.com. All right, Lee, let's do our picks tonight, and I will give you the honors. Okay, so I have two picks tonight. Um, last year, I did the Global Game Jam 2013, Woo-hoo. and the Global Game Jam 2014 is just coming up at the end of this month. So I want to give them a plug. Unfortunately, I will be out of town at the time um, visiting family, and I won't be able to do it. Um, but this was the uh, a, a very intense 48 hours. I did not sleep for th- 32 of those hours uh, in a row. And uh, you basically go and they give you a category, a topic, um, and you don't know what it is until you get there. And then you come up, you have 10 minutes to come up with ideas. You pitch them to the group. You ad hoc create these teams. And then the teams go off and 48 hours later, you have a working game. Um, and designers, sound guys, um, process guys, writers. The whole, the whole schmeal, they'll, everybody will be there, and you will, you'll be amazed at what you, what you can accomplish in, in two days. So it sounds like it's not just limited to developers, and it's not just limited to St. Louis, where we're at, Lee, right? You said this is the global game jam. This is the global game jam. That Last year, there were 309 locations worldwide, and they created over 3,000 games in the, over that weekend. So this year, they're aiming for 3,500 games and breaking the record. Oh, wow. That's amazing. Sounds like a lot of fun. It was a tremendous amount of fun. I would definitely suggest anybody that that wants to, to go out to uh, globalgamejam.org and find a location near you. There will be one. Excellent. Okay. My other pick is um, I... I wanted to send an email message to uh, to somebody that prefers to receive their email uh, encrypted. 
um, for for principal reasons more than anything else. And uh, and I, I I go for that. I, I can respect that. So I wanted to use my Gmail for that and found that Gmail does not out of the box allow you to do encryption in a standard PGP sort of format. So I found this thing called, let me make sure I get the name right, Mailvelope. And it does, it's an open PGP, uh, uses open PGP and it allows uh, any web mail uh, to do this. I've seen it used with, uh, uh, with Yahoo Mail, with Gmail, um, with Outlook web mail. And all of them, it works great. Uh, you just have to generate your RS, RSA encryption keys, and you can encrypt any email to anybody, and it's awesome. I would like to point out that the NSA is listening and reading, so watch really? out. <laughs> so those are my picks, John. Great picks, Lee. I'm especially uh, excited about the Global Game Jam. I'm going to have to see if I can get some friends scrapped together to go do that this year. Awesome. Okay, I have one pick. Uh, it's just about the beginning of the new year. It's early in 2014. And historically, I have been a very big proponent of setting goals and tracking goals and using goals in both my personal and professional life to um, advance myself. Recently, I haven't been doing a very good job of setting many goals. I've been working by myself and just been very helter skelter. So this year I'm going to try something differently. I heard about something called five days to your best year ever from a, a man named Michael Hyatt. Uh, he's a leadership coach that I recently had the pleasure to listen to speak and he's offering a course. Now this is a pay for course and it's it's not inexpensive, but it's not it's not uh, crazy expensive either. And uh, if you're listening to this when this is released, which will be about January oh, 12th or so, you'll have just a few days to take advantage of this course if you're interested. The course will close on January 16th, and uh, the special offer that I'll include in the show notes will expire as well. I'm not making anything off of this deal. Um, I found a discounted link from another podcast that I happen to listen to, and I'm just going to pass that along to you all. Someone else will make the money, not me. And uh, I have already signed up and enlisted in this and uh, offer you the opportunity to do the same. Do they get to see you, John, if they sign up? Boy, I sure don't know yet. Uh, I guess we'll, we'll see. <laughs> I'm not exactly sure how it all works just yet, but I'm 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 looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to setting some goals for 2014. I've already started that process. And I used to work at a place where we went through a whole goal setting process and while it was sometimes onerous and uh, sometimes a pain in the butt, it was also one of those periods of time where I think I had the most professional development occur. So, I'm very excited about an opportunity in 2014 to take some time to advance personally and professionally. Those are awesome. our picks. Yeah. And uh, that's all we have time for tonight. Lee, thank you very much for being part of the show. It was a blast, John. Thank you for having me. As always, you are most welcome and uh, look forward to having you back again very soon. I, I felt very safe, John. Thank you. Good. Lee, where can folks find out more about you on the internet? Uh, on Twitter, I am at Agile Atheist, and my blog is agileatheist.blogspot.com. Very good. And you can also find Lee in our Google Plus community if, uh, if, you're so, if you are so motivated to come and join us. We'll be out there chatting about uh, Agile and, and all the fun stuff that goes along with that. And I'm John Sextro. You can find me at johnsextro.com. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at JC Sextro. And of course, we have a wonderful website for the show, thisagilelife.com, where we keep all of the show notes and all of our picks and more information about the hosts and everything that we do on This Agile Life. Thanks for listening and keep living This Agile Life. <laughs>